um, I realized that um, um, doing high-quality trials and facing challenges in high-quality trials is a bit similar. So we will have some overlap here with uh, Anders' um, presentation. But repetition is the mother of all knowledge, so that's good. Um, my disclosure here is that I've been principal investigator of one published clinical trial, so it's not a whole lot, but we have one more soon to start. And I think um, that talking about clinical challenges is uh, something that I, I know of, because we started out the first randomized trial that we decided to perform. We di decided to perform in 10 countries at 36 sites, with about 250 in investigators and 950 patients. And if you build an index of that, it's a massive sum. I think it's 86 million or something like that. And uh, the, the second trial that we will go into has a little bit more. We double the size. Um, and as you realize, this is extremely complex all the areas where people will meet, where you have to take decisions. It's so complicated. And you can see all the stakeholders here. We have patients, relatives, investigators, clinicians, clinical trial units and managers, and yeah, you can read it. It's, it's a whole lot of people that should be involved in, uh, in a trial like this. So it makes the ischemia reperfusion cascade look like very, very simple, um, 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 simple mechanisms compared to what happens within a large clinical trial. We also have another problem with clinical trials, especially investigator-led clinical trials, is that it's almost all the time one-off projects, because you have the new research question, which will pose you to, uh, to, uh, to realize many, many new uh, aspects of your research. When you have waited three or four years since your last trial, someone will come from, for instance, UK and say, yeah, uh, we have slightly changed our ethical application process. So that will also pose you with totally new challenges. So you have to invent the wheel over and over. But as Anders said, there are some good cookbooks. I think also that we have a challenge that we mimic a lot of what the industry have been uh, saying to us being the gold standard, and we have to aim for that, but they have funding that is way higher than uh, what we have in investigator-initiated trials. When it comes to uh, the quality of a um, randomized uh, clinical trial, we talk a lot about internal and external validity, and you know much about that, but I think you can group the challenges also in internal and external challenges. And sometimes it feels like this guy is walking that direction instead, trying to push that ball down the, down the hill. So we have some internal challenges, your own knowledge in the field, your own experience, your own status, structure of your group, and also internal fears. I'll come back to that. And then we have some external uh, challenges with funding, ethics, insurance, monitoring, agreements, the culture that you meet, pharmaceutical interventions, and also the world around. So you, if you go for the uh, internal ones, knowledge, your own knowledge is key. You probably have a research interest, and that's a good start, I would say. But I think also that you should pick your research interest that has some meaning for, for the population that you uh, would like to, for the patients. And also it's a good thing to really think about the research interests in terms of funding, because it's easier to obtain funding for some diseases compared to others. You have to know your field, and as Anders said, uh, you have to survey the field. And if there is no systematic review available to lay the grounds, you should perform one. And I also think that when you identified uh, the knowledge gaps in systematic reviews, you should try to post them on knowledge gap databases, like the Duets database in, in the UK. The, uh, in Sweden, we have SBU uh, database on this, because that will tell the funders that we actually have the knowledge gaps um, out there. 
And then, as also Anders said, you should lay the ground with observational data, either service or observational registers, because with that you will get a lot of uh, good knowledge that you can use in your randomized trial, the frequency of the disease of interest, background event rate of the outcome of interest, the variability of the outcome, major independent predictors of the outcome, a number of patients in specific hospitals and regions. That will help you immensely when you design your trial later on. Then, of course, your own experience. Uh, it can be a challenge if you don't know anything about this. And if you have limited experience, exactly as Andrew said, you should team up with someone who knows what to do. And again, a clinical research unit or a clinical trial unit with statisticians, methodologists and experienced trialists. Uh, and as uh, Anders pointed out, um, he stole from uh, the Australian group and when we started TTM we stole from Anders and also from a pharmaceutical uh, company that I won't mention. <laughs> they don't know about that. Um, the Copenhagen trial unit for us in Scandinavia is a role model, I must say, for uh, how to perform uh, the stages up to a randomized trial. And we've also been very fortunate to work uh, with the, the George Institute of uh, Global Health in Sydney, Australia. And these are just examples on organizations that you can approach if you would like to perform a clinical trial. And Again, as Anders said, there are guidelines that will help you. This is a good um, homepage, a quarter network with all the guidelines for all kinds of reporting and uh, structure of clinical trials. Then, you need some brass. When you start out, it's difficult. You have to be at least PhD or have a professorship to get the money. So if you don't have that, you have to take the advantage of a bigwig. Uh, and we, in our group, we had a cardiologist that really uh, broke the boundaries into the funders uh, that we used as our bigwig, and he's the grandfather of, of the whole project. Um, and also, you need to have structure. You should find your accomplices, build networks, exactly as Anders said, and you said, what we think is a good thing is to have a multidisciplinary workforce with clinicians and all these different groups that we've been talking about. But I think we should also reach out beyond the boundaries of critical care medicine into cardiology, neurology, rehabilitation medicine in our case and others. And we should not stay alone. <laughs> this I will actually come back to in the end internal fear and your own conscience. So over to some of the external uh, challenges uh, when it comes to funding. The large-scale multi-center uh, pharmacological or industry-sponsored uh, trials, they usually cost in, uh, in uh, multiples of 10 million euros. They're extremely expensive. This is just an example of a Quite big trial, 14,000 patients in 300 sites. 300 million US dollar for that trial. It's a huge amount of money. And when it comes to investigator-led RCTs, they have, may have a budget of two to three million euros if they're really, really well funded. But at the same time, as I said before, we are aiming at the same standards that should be met, the GCP structure, and all the different regulatory um, uh, requirements we have. So we can never match this, but we're supposed to do the same job. And we have to uh, finance uh, infrastructure. We cannot just invent infrastructure the time when it's time for the uh, trial. It has to be there. And uh, institutions, your university or your hospital will probably cut a sum of the money that you, you get. So there's actually a quite big gap between what is uh, ideal and what is realistic. So you have to 
to really persuade the site investigators that they won't get the money that they really need. And as I said before, some diseases will attract funding easier. So I think you can choose the level of success. This is from uh, the Bible, Luke 19.26. It was not Luke who said it, it was Jesus. I tell you, whoever has will be given more. And I think that is very, very uh, ev relevant for, uh, for uh, researchers. If you have money, the funders think you're successful and you will get more money. And some funders will only give money if the trial can prove it's fully funded. And that's a little bit of a catch-22 situation, so you, because you will only become fully funded when you receive the money. So we had to actually lower our budget for a while just to say to the funders that we were funded, and then we could increase the budget again. And you ask for 100% and you receive 50 to 70, so then you realize you have to re uh, actually ask for 150%. And money is given for certain periods of time, and money starts to go a little bit stale and disappear before the project starts. And then you aren't really fully funded anymore. So we have this challenge. Yes, we are fully funded, but actually we need a little bit more. Thank you. But this is a good thing that you have to pay with instead. Academic currency. Steering group positions, author positions, possibility to perform additional research. And that will actually increase your group and build your collaboration. So I think it's a good thing that we can use that as a payment to sites. Just a few words on ethics and consent. Um, the process varies significantly over, uh, um, over the world with sometimes local boards, sometimes national boards. And the view of what should be regarded as part of ethical review vary uh, quite a lot, sometimes incorporating uh, data management things as well. And we have special challenges in uh, intensive and emergency care because we have patients that are incapacitated and can't take a decision. We have the Declaration of Helsinki that will guide us, and if we read it, um, we realize that we are working with vulnerable groups. And I think that you should take time to read the Article 20, Article 28, and Article 30 that states that we can do this research if it's not possible to do it in any other uh, group uh, that could be a substitute for our uh, um, incapacitated patients. But we also uh, should know that it states that the research entails only minimal risk and minimal burden. That's a challenge, actually, to, to fulfill these. Just a few words on insurance. That's also something that you really have to uh, take into consideration. Um, when you go outside of Scandinavia, re you realize that we have a quite good insurance system here for our patients, both for ordinary care and for research. You pay in a trial hundreds of thousands of euros for insurance certif certificates, but you also have hundreds of millions in reimbursements. So it's a bit scary when you start to realize this. We have quite a few providers out there, but we have realized that it's quite a limited interest from the insurance to, to, to um, ensure investigator-led trials because of our more capability to, to pay them. A few words on monitoring. This is something that is extremely uh, important for the internal validity of the trial, the external examination of the trial conduct. It was, a, I think, a neglected area uh, before, and today it's mandatory. It's time-consuming and expensive, but it's extremely uh, needed uh, for us to be able to say that what we did was actually uh, what we also uh, presented later, and we can be sure about that. I realize that you're standing up, um, uh, so I won't show you about agreements. I just wanted to see that um, it's sometimes very, very um, difficult to, um, um, to 
see what really um, you're uh, signing when you're signing agreements with, um, with uh, all the hospitals throughout the world. So my, um, I will just conclude here uh, with talking a little bit about the internal fears and, um, uh, and the conscience that I think that I would like to share as one of the main challenges of a clinical trial. Because even with a background where you build from the base up to the randomized trials, you have all the networks, all the ethical review boards that have uh, read and approved what you're doing. You have uh, the, um, the, um, the scientific community that says that it's something that you should uh, perform. In the end, when you sit there in your uh, office room or at night when you wake up, you realize that you randomize patients to one thing or another, and that's because of you. In, uh, in everyday clinical practice, there is random care, and that is probably worse than randomized care, because in a randomized trial, people usually take care of the patients, and the outcome is usually much better than for the, uh, the normal uh, population. But anyway, in the end, you may cause harm, as we've done with clinical trials. And I think that that is something you have to um, realize, think about, and discuss with your peers, that um, we try to really do good for, uh, for the community, and in the end, we will gain knowledge. But by doing so, we actually pose patients into different risks. And in the end, you're very happy if you can show that something was better than the other, or worse than the other, and that will be published. But it is also very important to realize that you have to face that you, in the end, have been uh, randomizing patients uh, to two groups, and that was because of your decision to perform that trial. So that's why I was so happy in, when I broke the code for the TTM trial that was absolutely no difference between the two groups. We had done nothing for three years. Thank you. <laughs>